my experience, guys. An ISA, we're talking about strategy. The step number one in training a great ISA, number, like step number zero, not even step number one, step number zero, is deciding what campaign they're gonna call for you. That is, it's not about the dialer, it's not about the data source, but those things are important, they're key. But the number one thing I think you need to do to be successful on ramping up and training an ISA to help you make these calls is the fundamental question. What are they gonna call? What process am I gonna plug them into to generate more qualified selling leads for me? are real buyers that will show up. We write letters for those. We're very specific in the letters that we write. So let's say it's Nick Baldwin. I'm going to write up the letter and it's going to say, hey, Mr. Seller, I've got a husband and a wife, Nick and Ann, and they're looking for the single family residence. It's in your neighborhood. Okay, according to my system, we are live on Facebook. So welcome, Lab Code agents. We appreciate you being here today. And you know, we're gonna talk about something that is probably one of the biggest things that we hear about over and over and over again. And that's the combination of two things. Sellers, how do we get more sellers? I hear this every day in real estate. You know, two years ago I felt like I couldn't have any other conversation. And then Inside Sales Associates. And what we're going to try and do is merge those two ideas together today because Inside Sales Associates or ISAs have become very popular and they're great ways to do business. But it's not just about, hey, I hired an ISA and now I'm going to go ca start cashing checks. There's a lot that goes into training that person and a lot that goes into make sure that we have the right setup. So I want to take a moment, introduce Gus. Gus is with Power ISA. They run a great company that, you know, if you're a person who doesn't have the time, energy, inclination to train your Oz ISAs, talk to Gus. He's that. And John, one of the clients that works with, with Gus. And we're going to talk about a lot of great stuff today. So tune in. But without any further ado, I want to pass this over to Gus. And uh, Gus, tell us, what we're, tell us a little bit about yourself and what we're going to do today. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Brian. You know, today what we're going to talk about really awesome topic, which is how can you get your ISA ready to prospect for homeowners, right? For sellers, calling sellers, prospecting sellers. It's a it's a hot topic. It's a big part of what we do every day in our life. Okay. But I will say this: the majority of the ISA projects that we do, I would say more than half, almost two-thirds of them, are mostly focused on database calling. And that's like internet leads, sphere influence, Zillow, port, realtor.com. That's like the bulk of what a lot of folks consider to be like the key ISA role. Like, hey, lead comes in, got to make that first call, second call, third call. And, you know, people know this, agents, you know it. Uh, we're, agents are really good. We're really good at making the first call. Like we're, we're like world class. We make that first call pretty consistently. It's the second through fifth call, which we kind of struggle with, right? So ISAs are kind of built to do that. And I don't know any top performing team that's converting those inbound internet leads at a high rate they do ISA. They all do some version of ISA helping them convert those leads. But another big piece of this, right, of the ISA role is actually that outbound pro that outbound prospecting piece. That outbound prospecting piece can also be a big part of your business. It can be important. It can be useful, right? So and and as we shift, this is a big part of it, why this is such a hot topic right now. As we shift to a more balanced market, right? And this is happening all over the country, a little bit more on the Western side of the country, California, Oregon, Washington, really feeling it. Boise, Denver, Phoenix, really feeling it right now. A big shift the last 90 days because we're seeing more inventory in the market. We're seeing less pending listings going out there. We're seeing a lot of these things pop up and they're, they're different. They're changing the landscape, right? As the market shifts, and I kind of think it's going to continue to shift. We just saw economic data come out there this week saying, hey, inflation is not done yet, which means the Fed is not done raising those interest rates. Not yet, not yet. And it will be at some point, but not yet. So we're going to continue to see the market cool off somewhat, come to a more balanced market, right? What does that mean, right? 
And for some folks, it's like it's like a threat. Like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I, you know, uh, my transactions are going to go down. Buyer activity is going down from like the fever pitch that it was six months ago. It's going down. What am I going to do? But there are always opportunities to share. I want to tell folks that, right? For the folks that are focused on the here and now and moving their business forward, the same thing that worked six months ago is going to work now. And that is whoever has the largest amount of real estate conversations every single day is going to win, regardless of where the market's going, okay? Regardless. Even the most dire predictions for this year are saying that we're going to sell over 5 million homes in 2022, right? And that's adjusted. That's a 20% decrease from 2021. That's, that's, a, that's a down year. 5 million has been the average for like the last five, six, seven, eight, nine years, actually. About 5 million homes sold. Very normal number. That's probably where we're going to land this year, right? And from, from 6 million, we're going to go to 5 million. That is 10 million sites. 10 million of these, right? So I want people to put this in perspective, right? Because we can get carried away with the headlines and the panic and the anxiety. And why is it my listing selling in the first five minutes? We're going back to more balanced market. That's why, right? And 5 million homes are going to be sold this year. 10 million sides, you just have to focus on talking to more people about real estate and getting your unfair share of those 10 million sides that could be sold this year, right? So that's what I want to tell folks. And prospecting can be a great way to do that. Prospecting, because the same way that you're seeing days on market creep up for your listings, the same thing is happening for those for sale by owners. The same thing is happening listings that wouldn't expire a lot more listings we, we tracked this our friends at red x gave us this information and they said on july 1st which is like the second super bowl expires for a whole year july 1st was a big date for expires they yeah. went up this year 70 percent seven zero 70 percent increase year over year so that's interesting for someone like me I'm like okay that that got my attention okay that's interesting so I have a prediction. We're going to see a lot of these more of these expired listings come on the market in the next few months, right? Because we're moving to a more balanced market. That's great. That's awesome. So I've got, hopefully I've got your attention. I've got your interest now, right? You're thinking, okay, okay, Gus, I'll play along. There might be some interesting things happening in the prospecting space right now. All right, that's great. How does an ISA fit into this process, right? Like how does it, how, how can I get my ISA helping you make these calls. And that's what we've got. The tremendous John D. Smith is here. Uh, he's a top agent in the Charlotte, North Carolina market. One of the hottest markets we've seen the last two or three years, by the way. Charlotte, North Carolina's home. Charlotte specifically been super hot. Um, and he has 20 years, almost 20 years experience um, in doing outbound prospecting, calling sellers, what circle prospect expired or sold by owner. And he's also a client of Power ISA. So very recently, he went through this same process. Like John went through, got an ISA and his team, got them making calls, talked to more motivated sellers. I think it's something like 14, 15 motivated sellers are in the pipeline for you, John. There's a lot of great things John's have done with his ISA. I want to get into that, but I want to set the table for this discussion because I believe this, I know John believes this, a lot of coaches out there believe this, that there is a certain, not all calling campaigns are made the same, guys. When we talk about prospecting for sellers, there's different categories, right? And there's different categories that lend themselves more to getting an I leveraging them out to an ISA more than others. Okay. We're talking about training. How do you train an ISA to get ready and prospect for sellers, right? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this: there is a spectrum. I'm gonna call it a spectrum of difficulty when it comes to prospecting for sellers. There's a spectrum here, guys. I would put on the far end of the spectrum, on the initial part, would be something like circle prospecting, right? Which is essentially kind of the, the phone book around a particular listing, a just listed, just sold campaign. And it's a very straightforward kind of campaign because you pick up the phone, make those calls, and you just let them know, hey, Mr. Seller, I just want to let you know, I just hold a home a few blocks away from you on 123 Main Street. I got these many bids, these many buyers, this much over asking, or I sold it in these many days. It was a great experience. And I've got more buyers now 
the word property like that. Who do you know that I should know that might be going to sell in the next few months, few, the next year, right? That's the script. Really basic script. Like it's, it's something like that, right? You just want to entice them, ask them if you know anyone. Okay, how about yourself? Have you thought of getting something bigger, something smaller, investing in real estate, right? Getting a second home. You can all qualify that. Do you own or do you rent your home, for example, right? It's a great question. You go down that rabbit hole. So, but that's one type of prospect. At Power ISA, we train all of our ISAs on certain prospecting because it's the number one, it is the easiest form of prospecting to teach. It is, and I've, I've done it all kinds. I've called all kinds of lists, all kinds of leads, all kinds of campaigns. Circle prospecting is still the most powerful campaign you can use because it is the easiest to teach. It's the easiest to teach. You teach someone a circle prospecting script. And they're getting qualified several weeks the next day. Okay. That is the power of that script. The biggest thing about that script is you got to put in the work. It takes a lot of calls to get those qualified sellers. It's not, you don't get, it's not like for sale by owner or expires. We talk to a motivated seller right away, right? No, you got to make those calls. You got to talk to 30, 40, 50 people a day to get one to two of those qualified seller leads in the pipeline, right? That's the biggest thing about school prospect. That's one category. A little bit over on the spectrum, I would call other types of lists that are like downsizer lists. You can say pre-foreclosure. You can say uh, a probate. You can say like divorce. It's a little bit further down the spectrum because a lot of times you're calling those leads with a really similar script. You don't call, like downsizers are folks that are like 65 and above that live in large homes, right? Like down, like they probably might be thinking of downsizing to something more comfortable, more appropriate. You don't call them up and say, hey, Bob, I just saw you turn 65. You want to get rid of that big house or what? You don't call them saying that. You actually call them with a really similar script to some prospect. That's what you're approaching them with. That's the goal. You're just calling around the neighborhood, trying to see if anyone's thinking of selling. That's where we put it close to the spectrum to that circle prospecting category. Over that, after that, I would call the old expireds, old expired listings, right? And I'm talking about three, six months old, a year old, a year plus, right? Because once the expired listing is past the initial onslaught of phone calls they get the first three, four days, right? Activity really dies down. And if they haven't listed the home again, they become an old expired, right? They're not on the market. They expire at some point. And, and we're not sure what's going to happen there after that, right? So the old expired after those a few months, it's almost like a like a circle prospecting call, right? Their their guard is a little bit down. They're not like upset, mad at the world, mad at you, mad at real estate agents, mad at everyone. Um, the the script is more like just checking in to see are they still considering an offer on their property? Would they still consider that, right? Do they know what's going on in the market right now? Are they still interested in just Qualifying for motivation at that point, right? Because, but, but it's a much different call than it was on day one, right? On hour number one of the next fire. That's a completely different kind of call. Okay, I would put it in that spectrum. After that, I would put something like an absentee owner, a for rent by owner, right? An investor, landlord owns a property, not living there, right? And has got it rented or thinking about rent as advertised as a rental. And they're kind of just waiting to see what they do. That is another great uh, category of calls to make, right? Why? Because a lot of those folks, especially right now, like in the last two years with the pandemic folks, everyone knows that, we went through these really tough eviction moratoriums, okay? Eviction moratoriums. A lot of landlords hated life the last couple of years. I'm one of them, by the way, actually, right? I had a tenant that trashed a property of mine. And I couldn't even build them on their security deposit. Again, not, you know, hey, it is what it is, folks. I'm not criticizing. I'm saying that's great or bad. You know, it, it, it is what it is. That was tough. 2021, I looked at my profit and loss. It was terrible for 2021 as a landlord. If an agent would have called me and told me, man, I'm, get that pro I'm not living in Washington State anymore. That property is there. I'll get, if they would have called me at the right time, that property would have been gone. Like, get rid of it. I don't want it anymore, right? But, but guess what? In the last 24 months, two people have called me. In the last two years, 
two real estate agents have called me asking me about that property. Have you considered selling it, right? That's why I think absent owners can be such a great opportunity because almost nobody calls them that are real estate agents. Investors, wholesalers, flippers, they, you get bombarded with that. But actual agents wanting to give you top dollar, very few people uh, are actually making those calls uh, and, and definitely they're not making them on a, on a consistent basis. I would put it there, right? At the other end of the spectrum, we're talking about a spectrum, easy to hard, right? Really simple. At the other end of the spectrum, I would put that expired listing, the new expired listing, the recent expired listing. That one takes more skill, right? That one takes more skill to convert, more practice. There's more objection handling. You have a more combative, potentially more combative kind of a seller, right? And these sellers, I have empathy for them. Especially right now, folks, listings that are, and we're, I'm going to talk to John about this. John's doing this every day in, a, in, a, in one of the hottest markets ever, right? You know, what's the mindset? Of a seller that like when expired when they thought, hey, isn't it this isn't this the hottest market on record? It's like what the heck happened? What, what's what's the what's the deal? What's the situation, right? So that's their their shell shock in a lot of these cases. And a lot of times, unfortunately, they have lost trust in that agent that took the listing line the first time. It's just the way it goes. It's unfortunate actually, right? And they just need someone come in new to tell them what to do to get it sold, right? So that's what they need. And you want to be that person. On the farthest end of the spectrum, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, John. On the farthest end of the spectrum, I would put the for sale by owner. I would <laughs> say probably, probably the most difficult kind of prospecting campaign to do because from the get-go, they don't think they need a real estate agent. That's right. the intro. And you give them a call and that's what they're going to tell you. Oh, you're well, another agent calling me. Oh, I get our agent calls. I don't need you guys. You know, you guys don't do anything anyway. Like, see you later. Right? <laughs> that is the, the, I think that's a pretty accurate spectrum of difficulty uh, when it comes to these, the, the most popular kinds of prospecting campaigns, the most popular ones, right? So that's, that's the spectrum. In my experience, guys, an ISA, we're talking about strategy. The step number one in training a great ISA, number, like step number zero, I don't step number one, step number zero, is deciding what campaign they're going to call for you. That is, it's not about the dialer. It's not about the data source. I mean, those things are important. They're key. But the number one thing I think you need to do to be successful on ramping up and training an ISA to help you make these calls is the fundamental question. What are they going to call? What process am I going to plug them into to generate more qualified seller leads for me, right? Which one of these campaigns? They all look the same. Let me just throw them at any of them. That's not accurate. That's not true, right? ISAs need to be set up for success, okay? And in my experience, throwing an ISA that's you on your team into a for sale, like a brand new for sale by owner, a brand new expired is kind of throwing them to the wolves, right? Mm -hmm. They practice. They need training. They need those object that object objection handling has to be on point, right? Throwing them at these newer expired, the most combative, the most difficult kind of seller to talk to, and expecting a bunch of appointments to come out kind of magically is not a winning proposition. It's not. A, so, John, I, I, I've been holding you, you know, the, the back there. I know, I, I know you want to you're bursting at the seams. We're going to talk about this. So, tell me about your experience with that 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 spectrum, and with your ISA when they first join your team. How's about that? Great stuff, Gus. Thank you very much. Um, let me first start off by saying I think one of the very first statements you just made a few minutes ago, Gus, what was the key. The, the real estate agents that have the most real estate conversations every day and every week are going to win. Okay? They're, they're going to win. And hopefully there's a specific laser-focused strategy with every call and like you mentioned, with every segment. So I'm about, mm, let's say, 10, 11 weeks in. Okay, Gus, I think I'm pretty close there. And had two different ISAs. And I started, this is new to me. Okay, I'm, you know, 18 and a half years in the business. But this is my first experience with an ISA. So 
for the listeners out there, Gus's group at Power ISA, I would highly recommend them to any real estate professional. They do an incredibly thorough job of screening, selecting, making sure you are the best fit for their next candidate. And then it's kind of how you want to position it. So the long and the short of it is the reason a guy like myself has retained an ISA is I'm not getting enough calls out. I'm with uh, EXP and I'm gone a couple times a month now, training, masterminding with my agents, my downline, agent attraction, as we call it, bringing on new agents. So when I'm gone, I'm not on the phone and I lose all that critical prospecting time. So I met Gus earlier this year. It's been a wonderful partnership. Again, I highly recommend him and his staff to anybody that's thinking along these lines. But what I recognized almost immediately when I first spoke to the first couple ISAs that we just had casual conversations with, it's so easy to overthink this. So there's two things going on here. And Gus and I talk about this now every week. What are we looking for? People that seriously want to sell that have not committed to another agent. That's that's the target. That's the gold star target. Wherever they are, whatever niche, as Gus says, we're targeting, that, that's the golden goose right there. Now, within that, there's three steps to this process. Number one, how do you get a hold of them? There's 50 other John D. Smiths chasing every one of them every week, right? If not 100 or 200 here in Charlotte. Once you get a hold of them, how do you get the listing appointment? And then once you finally get there, how do you secure the listing? Because they're probably going to interview you know, several realtors before they make a decision. So what I've noticed is let's keep this as simple as possible. These ISAs I first talked to, they had layers and layers of questions and comments for these people that would just answer unannounced, unexpected cold calls. And they, they think they got to get you through a long list of checks and balances, questions, comments. You don't have that much time. You don't have that. Some people are in the car, they're driving. Some people you catch them eating dinner. You don't have that much time. So what I said, I'm going to give you a lot of stuff here rapid fire, okay? Because I'm being considerate of our time. So I'm just going to go and then we'll talk about that video, Gus, because that was an absolute grand slam. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I want to get to that too. I want to get to that too. Yeah. So... I'm going to just kind of go down a road here. Keep it very, very simple is the first thing I would tell an ISA. This is not a long conversation. This is in and out, quick, fast. Is there a pulse? Is there a prospect here or not? Be incredibly polite. Be incredibly upbeat because people don't like to get interrupted. We're interrupting their day, and that's going to get a tone immediately. So you better be good. You better be update. You better be incredibly polite or it's not going to last long. OK, you got one chance to impress, which means one chance to keep the conversation going and hopefully lead to a further conversation. OK, we don't get four chances. Um, I put it to my newest ISA this way. She came from a background. She had a little bit of experience, not a lot, where she was held pretty much accountable daily, weekly, monthly. We expect this, we expect that, whether it's contacts, appointments, database, whatever it is, kind of like shell-shocked. I don't know if I can do this. I've never done this before. So once we got to talk and I said, all right, let's just have an easy conversation. Let's stop. What happened in the past is in the rear view mirror. Let's draw a line in the sand and let's have some fun with this. Wow, that's a breath of fresh air. And this is my new boss talking, right? This is my new client. So I said, let's do it this way. Her name is Casey. I think I can say Casey. Okay, Casey, let's do this. This is no more complicated than you and I are going fishing. So we're going to get in a rowboat. You're going to put your line in the water, and I'm going to put my line in the water. And if you get a bite, what's a bite? It's a homeowner that has expressed a serious positive interest and selling their home sometime soon. That's your job. When you get a bite, you get a hold of me immediately. Call, text, email, just get a hold of me as soon as you can after the call hangs up within reason. Then it's my job to get them in the boat. I think it's too much of a daunting, this is just me, 
Okay, this is just me because I'm getting a lot of good traction as to what we're doing now. I think it's way too much to ask of an ISA to find the to target the prospects, find the prospects, weed them up, clarify them, qualify them, and be expected to get appointments on a regular basis when they may be in a different country. I think that that's forgive me if I'm out of my lane here, but I think that should just. I think that's my job. So if you found the prospect, hey, yeah, thanks for the call, Casey. My wife and I are seriously considering enlisting this fall. That's a drop everything call right there. That's, uh, you know what I mean? How soon can we yeah, get to that prospect? Uh, 100%, John. Uh, the only thing I, I, I would add to that is that I, I definitely agree in the sense that this cold calling ISA role, I think it is primarily a lead generation role. Okay, perfect, it's a lead perfect. generation role. What I mean exactly. by that is the best use of your ISA, the best leverage you can add to a, to a prospecting campaign is get your ISA focus on these truly cold lists, like a circle prospecting list. Call through that sucker. Get in, like hundreds of calls, right? Hundreds of calls and identify the people, like you said, John, that are potential sellers that you've confirmed their address. It's the owner. This is their phone number. And there's interest there to sell and hand them over to the agent. That exactly. is a model. So let me put it this way. Every single successful uh, outbound prospecting campaign that I've worked with uses that model. Yep. I think that a lot of times if you get, and folks, we might be hitting some nerves here. People might go, oh, no, my goodness, that's not what I want. Guys, this is the way to be successful. You can, just, mm -hmm. you can choose another way. That's fine, right? But we've seen when you throw an ISA at, uh, uh, the highest uh, skill level they need for sell by owners and expire to hope that for the best, like a bunch of appointments coming in. I think we lost Gus. We yeah, lost we Gus. Froze. He froze up. So, you know, technology gets us sometimes. So, okay. well, hey, John, we got about two minutes left before we're going to close up. But so let me ask you this real quick. So what have you seen as you obviously you've been working with ISA? How long did you say it was? I'm about 10 weeks in. OK, about 10 weeks in. So here's the, the thing I'd like you really just discuss in the last few minutes. is What is different in your business 10 weeks ago versus today. And, and obviously, you know, day one, we're not going to see this massive change in our business. That's not how things work. Everything has a cycle and move through. But with that in yeah. mind, after 10 weeks, you know, two and a half months, what kind of changes have you seen? What yeah. benefits? What challenges have you had? Because I think it's to understand. I want to say this. ISAs are great to have, but they bring challenges. And I think people need to know what those challenges are. That way we can solve for them. It doesn't mean yeah. a challenge isn't, oh, my God, the program is broken. A challenge is, hey, how can we fix this to make sure we continue to integrate it in our side of our business? So if you would share that in the last couple of minutes, yeah. I think that'd be really beneficial for the audience. I think a fantastic question, Brian, at this point. Um, case in point, the short answer for me, two closings in the bank paid for. Um, I think I got now 18 or 19 new legitimate seller prospects that have expressed a serious interest. Now, what I call a seller prospect, not somebody that answers the phone. And that's a, <laughs> To me, a seller prospect is somebody that I've met with or spoken to directly that says, John, I am seriously interested about selling in the next three months, six months, 12 months. To me, that's that's the that's the target right there. I think I've got 18 or 19 of those on my newest prospect list, Brian, that I didn't have before. So, so I, I want to say this to the audience to make sure everybody understands. In 10 weeks, which is basically two and a half months, you have yeah. eight potential people 19 potential people who are going to list their house over the next 12 months exactly that i wouldn't have had before and just from a perspective because i don't know your business approximately how many units a year does your business close myself your your business whether you're an individual agent a team or yeah how, how many at my, at my peak say um 35 to 40 I'm doing a little less than that now because I'm gone a lot training and masterminding and working with Gus here. But at my peak, 35, I mean, I've been in the 40s four or five times. Um, so that's a pretty good number now. As, as somebody who was closing 35 to 40 transactions in two and a half months, 
he's gotten 18 potential clients. That's right. half of what John was doing in an entire year. He At peak. Two and a half months. Yeah. So it's just, I, I want you guys to understand this. This is the leverage, the note, the letter, the thing we hear over and over. Gus will talk about this leverage, 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 leverage. Here's another thing I think is amazing about what John said. John said, Hey, I'm also gone two days a week. So it's not like, you know, it, it, he's, working less hours on this part of the business and increasing simultaneously. And that's what leverage is all about. And that's what an ISA is about. Go ahead, John. Hey, Brian, watch this. I, I know you're watching your clock, Brian, but I, I got to share this if I can. Yeah. Excuse me, Gus. Yeah. My, it, second, it, 100%. my second oh, yes. ISA, one of you guys earlier mentioned database. So one week, my, my newest ISA gets a hold of my database. You know, I got 11, 1200 new names in there. And I don't know who she's calling. So she texts me one day, kind of, I can just see the, John, I have an actual listing appointment for you Friday at three. I'm like, what? You know, I'm just, if she got a prospect, I'm excited. She said, I have a listing appointment for you. I looked at the name address. This was a previous client of mine from like seven years ago when the market was much different here in Charlotte. I mean, I'm not going to mention anything. This is the hardest client you'd ever want to even have. A, I mean, rude, hard shelled, ready to. She got a listing appointment. As soon as he heard John D. Smith, and I'm calling here for John D. Smith EXP Realty, guess what? She hit him at the right time. You, oh, yeah, I know John. She didn't say John used to be my age, but I know John. And that's all he would give her. Why don't you do this? Tell John to plan on being over my house. He knows where I live at three o'clock Friday afternoon. And we'll go from there. I almost fell off my chair because <laughs> she approached it the right way. So all kudos to Power ISA and Gus. That goes back to the, she, he got me the right type of candidate. And then a couple of quick sessions to polish the apple. Now she's on fire. And what happens now she's got confidence where in her previous life, she was terrified to make the next call because she's terrified of failing. So, I mean, this sounds ridiculous. We're getting in a rowboat. We're fishing. If you get a bite, just get a hold of me and I'll get them in the boat. When you, because you're talking language barriers in a different country. Now, I haven't turned her loose yet on expireds. I don't think she's ready to, to jump in this microwave over here in Charlotte of expireds right now this minute she'd get eaten alive she's not ready for that yet so let's get her built up with a, a degree of confidence in cold canvassing cold prospecting a little bit of database if you got a substantial database because they all know you and your they should know you in your database whether you email them every week you know with a, a retroactive system but she's got so much confidence now we talk almost every day she can't wait to get to the phone the next day so that's a touchdown. Now I just got to kind of refine her. We'll go a few more miles. And then I'm going to ease her into, I start with withdrawals and then expireds and then for sale by owners. So um, Brian, I mean, you guys can do the math probably better than me. You get two, three, four closings to an agent that's contemplating, you know, is this within my budget? Well, you just paid up for the whole year. Everything yeah, else is- a hundred percent. Now you're on and house you money. A hundred percent. Right. And I love that, that story, John. And I, I'm thinking about that because you've got, you know, two, a couple of listings already and 18, 19 prospects within two to three months. It reminded me of another one of my clients, right. Who started back in January. This is Ben Riles out of uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, outside, a suburb outside of Minneapolis. And in the first six months, because it takes, it actually compounds, it accumulates, right. You, you, yep. don't, you don't get a bunch of listings the first 30 days. It doesn't work this way, right? You accumulate. And all that Ben does is call absentee owners. That's his business. He doesn't do anything other than call absentee owners. That's all he has his ISA's call. It's not an expired listing. It's not a FISBO. It is a high converting lead source because Ben, with one ISA, got 10 transactions, 10 transactions wow. within six months. And John, wow. I'm gonna I'm gonna go up venture on you know on a limb here, and I think you're on that same track, right? Two months in, 19 prospects. You're a closer. You know what to do with these folks, right? You're gonna yep. get multiple transactions out of this one ISA, and that's oh, the yeah. goal you want to see. You want to see a 10x return. 
Whatever you right. put into the project, time, effort, uh, you know, paying the ISA, you want to see that 10 times return. There's less and less lead sources out there that can give you a 10x return. Zillow's not one of them, by the way. If you pay a 35% referral, you're not making 10x anything, right? If you're, if you're paying those kind of fees or if it's like 500 bucks for a lead. But prospecting, especially when you leverage it with an ISA, is one of those activities where you can get a 10x return on your lead generation spend. But, you know, you're, you're hearing it directly from John. You're hearing a lot of these anecdotes. Focusing your ISA on these lead sources where they can have the most success is going to pay a lot of those dividends. It's going to pay it. It's going it's to happen, right? So, and, and I will say this, a couple of things I want to I wanna, I wanna toss over here to John. Number one, John, you got to tell us about that video you sent to your prospects. I mean, that list of people, you got to tell us about that video, number one. And number two, I have been so impressed by, you know, the work that John has done with his ISA, training them up, getting such a great result from them, that I, I actually hired John to be a coach for our clients, right? That's really, really big. That's really, really huge. So at, if you're a client of Power ISA right now, you get every week, we have a coaching session on prospect being expires and physicals and outbound and all these different things from a guy that's doing it every single day like John. Tell us about that, that voice, that, that, that video, John, that you sent and why do you think yeah. it was so powerful? Hey, John, before you do that, I'm going to I'm going to say this. We're going to finish with this. We are over. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, we've had a, a, a great discussion today. So I want you to finish up, John, and then we'll kind of button this up. I definitely we'll want it on that. that. We'll it on that. Yeah, very important. So, John, finish up with that thought and then uh, I'll button it up and, you know, we'll let people go and go out and sell some sell some houses. Right. So, John. OK, Brian, will do. So remember about a month or so ago on that one Wednesday, interest rates went up three quarters of a full point in one day. So here comes all the media. Here comes all the social media panic overreact. OK, I put together a little two minute bit, about two and a half minutes in length, the video, and I just sent it to my current seller prospect list, a little bit of my sphere of influence, some people that I have currently or very recently been in conversation with. Just, it wasn't even a direct, like a, it was just like an FYI, okay? I got three listings out of it that weekend. So talk about something that, you know, I'm fishing for perch and I, here comes a walleye, you know what I mean? Or a musket, what, you know, I'm from Michigan originally. So I don't fish that much. It sounds like I do, but anyway, so here's the thing. People way overreact. A lot of it due to the media, way overreact. So I started off the video, Brian, like this. I get asked almost every day, John, where do you think this market's going? Did you see the announcement just yesterday, John, these interest rates? Oh my gosh, John, what do you think? So my canned response at this point was this. Yeah, I'm aware of what's going on. I see the interest rates. They're going up. They're going up very aggressively. But you know what? In my humble opinion, they're getting back to normal. So let's let's clarify this. We are spoiled rotten at two, two and a half, three percent. We're probably never going to see that ever again. So not in our lifetime. We're getting back, you know, five and a half, six, six and a half percent. That's normal. It's normal. It's where we were. Now, people like me that have gray hair on their head, when they bought their first house, it was nine and three quarter. Then I went to 11 and a half, and that was a good deal. So you know what? Yep. Deal with it. Deal with it. Now, let me let me put a little more clarification into this. It's all relative. Now, what I mean by that is, yeah, if like, let's say I was a seller. If I list today and I'll get X amount, yeah, if I would have listed three, four, five months ago, maybe I'd have got a little more for my house. But watch this. If you sell for top, top dollar, you're probably going to turn right around and buy for top, top dollar. If you sell for a little bit less, then you can probably turn right around and buy for a little bit less. It's all relative. So if all the dominoes are lined up for you and your family to move, the kids are out of school, you know, a second home, whatever it is, new neighborhood, different schools. If everything is lined up in your family's, what I call the dominoes, go ahead and move. Do your homework very religiously on both ends. Go ahead and move.
But if interest rates alone are the one and only deciding factor for you to move or not, that's wrong. Your weight, the numbers are way too tight. You got to reassess everything you're looking at. If the interest rates alone, that's wrong. Okay. So there, that's one part of a much larger conversation. So long story short, Brian, just calm down. There's still a lot of great things happening. This is still in most areas. Gus will tell us. Gus is one of the most learned men in the business and his dedication to statistics and input and data is second to none. I'm not embarrassing you, Gus. I, I got to know you well enough. Okay. Thank you, if it makes sense, just go ahead and do it, but do your homework, but don't let the media sway you when it doesn't make any sense. Okay. So do your homework on both ends, but don't let one item like interest rates make your final decision for you. Because none of us can control interest rates. You just do the best you can. So if you have to sell a little bit less, you get to buy for a little bit less. If you sell for top dollar, okay, that's great. But now you're going to have to pay top dollar to get the next one. You know what I mean? I'm from the Detroit, Michigan area. And now I live in Charlotte. So I have experienced, I mean, you talk about the spectrum. I used to have to go on four or five listing appointments with for sale by owners in Michigan to find one that could sell because everybody was upside down. When the auto industry got crushed, that, that's when I cut my teeth in real estate. Good timing, huh? So now I'm in sunny Charlotte where you can't keep a listing 10 minutes here. We're, like Gus said last week, we're still one-to-one. One-to-one. -one. One -one. So in my own subdivision, there's 700 homes, there's 29 realtors, and we have one active listing right now. Yeah, absolutely. All right. that, it's a piece thank, of cake. thank you so much, John. You know, I, I appreciate you, John. If people have questions about how you train the ISA, the script, what, and you know, and you do, you also do coaching, you know, you're coaching with us. Yes. How, you as a coach, how can people reach out to you? If they want to continue the conversation, John, go for it. Sure. My cell number directly is 704-999-0896. That's 704-999-0896. Awesome. John. All right. Thank cool. You for being here. I know thank we're a little bit over time. Sorry about that. Hopefully it's been useful for you guys. I still see everyone connected. Hopefully this is a good one. I got a lot of value okay. out of this one. Thanks everybody. Thank you thank very you much so guys much for joining us today. I sure appreciate it guys. Talk to you later. Thanks everybody.